Okay. We are back. I am Ken Rakowski, Sandy Grigsby, Kenneth Robert Joseph, Dimitri Rakowski with the sir in front if you want to go by the formal title. This is Sandy Marissa Grigsby. No other names? No, do I need more? I don't know. Hold on. Sandy, Marissa, rock star, no. badass, bomb babe, Grigsby. There you go. Call me that. Oh, AKA Queen. Salivaya, C. Salu. Saluvaya. There What's you your go. full name? Saluvaya, Hulutungua, Ungatea, Diana, Fonua. I knew it was going to be amazing. Do you want to just call her Diana? Does that make <laughs> oh my gosh. Ask, ask Paul his real name, his full name. Uh, Mighty Paul, what's your full name? That's so cool. I think you're just making that up. God. That's what I said. <laughs> I mean, could you imagine if he was drunk, caught drunk driving the office, goes, sir, what is your name? You go, <laughs> <laughs> no, you're drunk. You go no, to I'm jail. Not. You definitely go to jail. So I want <laughs> you guys to think about a triangle. And the triangle has time on top, Money on this side and energy on this side. Money, time, energy. Money, time, energy. And when we're young, we have all the time and all the energy, but none of the money, right? Then we get to middle age, we have money and energy, but no time. And then when we get old, we have time, money, but zero energy. And our goal is to hit all three points of that triangle to make sure we have time, energy, and money. Problem is you can never really buy time. I mean, you could manipulate time by getting assistance. You can manipulate time by um, getting rid of other things that are on your schedule. You've gotten very good uh, with time because you have an assistant, but actually your partner, which is Ava. And then you have a, an assistant that's involved. You have different time zones with people that are working for you. Mm -hmm. So you manage time while you're sleeping. Yes. Right? Unless you wake up and they didn't do anything and then you're more stressed. Yeah, right. Which does happen, let's it, be real. It does happen. And I realize the more people you have in your network that you work with, the higher propensity of failure occurs because you're not in charge anymore. Do you agree with me on that? Depends. Go on, let me ask. Right now, if it was completely up to you to launch one of your products, 100% up to you. Would you get it out faster? Yes. Right. So you working with your team, which now, of course, is, are doing more. It takes longer. There's more explaining for you. And the propensity of failure occurs greater. That's why a lot of entrepreneurs want to DIY. That's right. They want to do it themselves, which is important. The time it takes to explain it to someone, you could have done it 17,000 times. But if we're at the top of the triangle of time, we really do need other people inside, let's say our collective, to get things going. But again, propensity for failure tends to occur. The one thing you want to make sure is you can't blame the failure on them. That's true. You have to take it yourself because you brought them in. Right. Okay. And the question is, most of us, it's not a question, most of us will initially go, oh, damn, they messed up. Oh, my God, does that irritate me? And you go, ah. and then you go, of course, because we're all entrepreneurs, I'll do it. And then all of a sudden, that top of the triangle time. Dante's laughing. He's like, that's me. You named me. Yeah. The triangle <laughs> now of time diminishes and you get more stress because now you have less time. And what, it does, what does it do? It sucks your energy. And it gives you belly fat. <laughs> what? It sucks your energy. And then, of course, it uses your resources. And then, poof, the triangle's gone. Gone. Okay? So what we need to do today is I want to talk about some epic failures. Mm -hmm. I want you to talk about some of your epic failures. I know, Dante, go. Because I want us to do something that's unique. I want us to celebrate some of our failures. Okay. And when I say celebrate, what was your worst relationship when you were dating somebody? All of them except for yours. Was there any one in particular that was horrible? That's like, we, could, we could be here for hours. They don't want to hear my drama. Okay. Do you, you want me to just pick one? 
Yeah, one. Okay. You don't have to get so deep into it. So I dated this one guy and he was so obsessively controlling that he bought me a plane ticket somewhere uh -huh. and I couldn't get home. Oh, one way. <sighs> one way ticket. Like the middle of nowhere. There wasn't even an Uber. I literally could not get home. Did he send you to India? That He did it twice, actually. He sent me to India and left me there. And then he sent me to Washington somewhere in Virginia. Epic fail of a relationship, right? My, my, I had to move out of my place and hide from him for three weeks at a friend's house to get away from the psychopath. My last relationship was my epic failure. And that was they they robbed me blind, basically. Pretty much. Okay. Epic failures. And, and, it, and it was a lot of money then, which would be even more now because it was in crypto. Yeah. But I, I am going to celebrate that epic failure because I would never have met you. I would never have learned what not to do. And I know what I need to do to make a successful relationship. I needed that failure to get the best thing in my life. Ah, oh, that's so true. You're such a smart man. <laughs> but I needed that. That epic failure would never have brought me the joy that I have. And that triangle is fruitful. I found more time because of you. I have a lot more energy and we're, we're doing financially incredibly well. So the triangle is becoming realistic. Yes. Does that make sense? Totally makes sense. I needed that failure. Yes. How about you? Did, did that guy help you find your success? You know, in a way he did. Of course he did. Because he made me realize that I'm not going to date any more psychopaths. Like they can't be complete whack job nutcases. Okay. And from that point moving forward, because I was involved in that whole Tony Robbins world, it actually opened up my awareness to the reality of what's really happening in that world, which then made me leave that world for better worlds, which introduced me to the people who introduced me to the people who introduced me to Ken. There you go. So, yeah. so the epic failure of your relationship has actually guided you to a place of success. Exactly. The problem is you have those nightmares every now and then. No. Sometimes they text your mom out of the blue and she's like, why is he texting me? Mom, change your number. So in cultures like Japan, failure is seen as death. Yeah. It's seen as death. So what happened was other than Sony and Toyota and other car companies that become multi-conglomerates, entrepreneurship was actually at a low. It was at a low. Until, Which might be a good thing because those Japanese are pretty smart. And if they didn't all do that, then none of the Americans would have had a chance. It would be no. the United States of Japan. <laughs> be real. Uh, so what happened was that failure complex did not allow them to dive into entrepreneurship. And by the way, that's a culture we see a lot in Asia. Yeah. We, we see, but it's interesting. We, we spent eight months in Indonesia. And as you're driving down the Jakarta roads or in Bali, you see little stands everywhere. There are entrepreneurs left and right. Everywhere. And they hustle, baby. And they do it out of necessity, not out of want. No. Because otherwise they couldn't get a job. If they can't get a job, they can feed the family. So entrepreneurship is either out of a necessity. And I think the necessity ones are not creating things of greatness. Mm -hmm. You know, they're selling fruit or some massage service or something like that, right? Some where the entrepreneurship of creating or fixing something are the ones that are great, but that's where the massive epic failures come from. Yep. Eddie, how many times did you take an idea and fail with it, fail with it, fail with it until you found some success with it? George Foreman, first one. It failed for almost a year and a half, millions of dollars because um, it was called the slanted grill at first and it just, People didn't get it. We didn't sell it right until we put a celebrity in front of it. And even the till slanted grill just sounds crooked. It, <laughs> it was a panini grill. And one, somebody in the office says, let's make the legs in the front shorter so it had a slant. <laughs> there you go. But I mean, tweak, tweak, tweak. You guys have probably heard me talk about, um, uh, what was his name? Um, oh, God, my brain. This guy that created this device that basically you sang in. Remember him? Oh. Oh, I got to remember his name. So it was 1855. This guy basically. Ridiculous. No, no, no. This guy made this device 
that sat in the middle of the room. It was like this big. I can't believe it, you don't remember that guy. You always remember his name. Antonio Marcuccio. See, That's I it. knew it would come. Yeah. I was closer with Perniculus Collini. No, Antonio Marcuccio made this device that sat in the room. Yeah, was this big. And Antonio Marcuccio, this device basically had these long tubes that would go from one room to another room. And as long as you would sing in one side of the tube, way on the other side of the room, you could hear the singing. But the moment you would talk, what would happen? Stop. It would break. The circuit would break. Antonio Marcuccio kept on trying to make, basically it was creating like a, almost like a karaoke system before there was any music. But there was no use for this. There was no use for a device that you would sing into and hear the singing on the other side of the room. So he mothballed it, scrapped it, hibernated it. Unless you were in a prison and you needed to sing for an inmate on the other end. I don't know if that was even a thing back then. Probably so 15 because, years know, they, later. Did you remember that movie with Leonardo DiCaprio where he had to wear the mask and he was in the prison? Oh, Man and Iron Mask, of course. That was a great movie. Was, he would have singing. enjoyed that. Because otherwise he had to send rats like through the holes to the other, like the little messages. So 15 years later, this guy took Antonio Marcuccio's device, turned it on, had the tubes all over the room, got the same, same thing, singing, oh. And the minute he talked, it broke, it broke, it broke. So what he did was he sat back and he looked at everything on there and he took just one screw and turned it a quarter of a turn more. What was that guy's name? Leonardo DiCaprio. No, Thomas Alexander Graham Bell. Oh. <laughs> he, will, he will probably play, be played by Leonardo DiCaprio. Maybe, but Alexander Graham Bell took somebody else's epic failure and turned it into something that was great, literally transformed our world. So the problem was if Antonio Marcuccio gave up, which he did, we don't call it the Marcuccio, right? Wait, we call it call Bell. Them? Oh, Bell, Mom Bell, Mama. So Pac Bell. All those are bells because it's after Alexander Graham Bell. You, you, it could have been. It could have been, right? Marcuccio. Sounds so, like Marcuccio got screwed literally. You literally, oh, literally got scared. Yeah, I like you. <laughs> You're funny like me. Well, but the idea was most of us give up after our epic fail. Yeah. And we give up because we go, oh. And I think what happens is, especially in the world today, unless it literally is dead on arrival or it can never be resuscitated or something crazy like that, we can't give up. We can't give up. Now, if you're in a really bad relationship where the person hits you or really destroys you, yeah, there's, there's, there's points to where- Give up. It's destroying you. On the person, not yourself. Like, for example, I just talked to an actor here that moved here from the United States who gave up on Hollywood, but didn't give up on acting and now is making a ton of money in Bollywood. So what he did was he reassessed his course to realize that I'm never going to give up on my, my art, my love. He just had to find out where his new home was going to be. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think this is also with like Sandy, Sandy's got this killer product concept confidence jam. If she was marketing it to senior citizens in nursing homes, she would probably say, I'm not selling any of these confidence jam programs anymore. Gonna give up. Going to give up. You just have to find a new home to market it. And that Great. was, executive coaches and people that are hungry for what it is so you change your trajectory mm -hmm. most of us don't most of us say i'm not finding what i want because i'm literally in the wrong place there's a, a joke um this guy walks into this guy's house by the way it's a polish joke i'm polish but i'm not going to use the word polish guy walks into the house and he sees this uh, guy rumbling through the, the living room going, what are you looking for? He goes, I'm looking for my wallet. Because you're looking for your wallet. Where did you lose it? He goes, in the kitchen. He goes, well, why are you looking for it in the living room? He goes, because the light's better here. And I, and I think what most of us do is we try to do things where the light is better because they think the audience is bigger. But it's actually in the wrong room. It's in the wrong place. So for example, um, Michael Bishop, who is part of the metal community, he's a chiropractor. He's one of the best chiropractors in all of Asia. Yeah. And he found that looking for his clientele, 
were actually living on YouTube. He started marketing himself on YouTube, which is insanely inexpensive, isn't it? It's super cheap. Yeah, like what, like $6. For every dollar he spends, he gets a thousand X return. A thousand X return. He had to turn off his YouTube marketing. It was too much. He had too many clients. So he was looking in the wrong place initially. He found the room where he actually lost his wallet. <laughs> Turned it on, bam. By the way, uh, YouTube advertising in Asia is so damn dirt cheap. Eddie, I just, any of your marketers out there, it is so inexpensive. Uh, you might want to consider looking at YouTube ads because one, they don't pay for premium. They don't skip ads. And if you say, hey, you want to make money? They watch the whole ad. Just a thought. So when we think about epic fails, Again, we're looking where the light is good, not where you lost your wallet. So we need to kind of change the way we see epic fails. You were just reading how many people had epic fails that are entrepreneurs, didn't you? Yes. Where are you going? What are you doing? Am I talking too much? No, I'm making sure I'm not missing somebody who wants to join our amazing. Oh, show. got it. So you saw Walt Disney, right? You have big hair right there. Donald Trump. Sarah Blankley, um, epic fails, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, they all had epic fails. Do you know what Bill Gates' first business was? Anybody know what his first? Really? You don't like Bill Gates? Okay. Bill Gates' first business was a traffic light metering company. That makes sense. Well, it failed. It failed. And um, he learned how to work with the computers for the traffic lights. And that's what he learned to use to code something called DOS, mm -hmm. which became the disk operating system that literally started Microsoft. It wasn't Windows first, it was DOS. I'm not sure if you remember getting these, these floppy disks. You probably don't remember any of that. I either. remember all that. Yes. I'm a Mac I'll program. run out to go and instead of I'll run for this Altair. Oh, yeah, that was the Altair. That's where he learned to do it from something called Trafo, Traffic Meter or Trafo. I forget the name of the first company, but it was all around traffic. Yeah, the important was, part is the Altair did nothing but have lights. <laughs> that's it. Qualified as a computer. It's, it's just amazing, but that's where he learned to <laughs> operate operating systems. So we, or look at Colonel Sanders. Colonel Sanders, <laughs> which you see everywhere, isn't it what funny? What was his first job? He was probably a colonel. <laughs> But his, his secret recipe, he went to a hundred locations for people to see if they want it. Yeah, no one did. Nobody wanted it. No. no but he did give up because he believed in the family recipe. Wait, he did give up. He did. In the 60s that he actually got it going. He did. Let's see, let see if he's, I got a picture. He spent two years yeah. traveling around the country. He went to over 1,500 investors looking for money. Everyone told him no. He slept in his car for two years. That suit that he wears, that white suit. It's literally one of the only suits that he had. And sometimes the only thing he had to eat for a couple of days at a time was just the samples of chicken that he was bringing around. <laughs> I so, love you guys' the story. Yeah, he, like he, his is an amazing story. He also suffered depression before he became successful. Do you see that right there? That right there is Colonel Sanders in Arabic. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, these are epic fails that we need to celebrate. Who's an entrepreneur that you get excited about? Anyone in particular? I like Sarah Blakely. Tell me why. I just think she was brilliant because I came up with that idea a long time ago and I didn't do anything about it. And now she's changed the lives of women all over the world because they can fit into their little dresses and skinny jeans now wearing her spanky spank. Yeah, she took $5,000. I'm not sure if anyone saw yesterday that Blackstone basically bought a big chunk of it. Sarah's company now for $1.5 billion, by the way, and she now will have this whole, this conglomerate, the entire board are all women. It's brilliant. It's the only way a woman's apparel company should be working is we're having all women anyhow, right? Only but makes sense. Like who invented high heels? The guy. Oh, yeah. Guys, you know. if you invent it, you should have to use it for at least <laughs> 10 years. <laughs> yeah, but guys wore high heels before women did. Ooh. War past tense. No, no, I know what Eddie's saying. Yeah, the, the, the French, the French and the British did wear high heels. That's yep. true. And they're so peachy. So let, let's talk about 
this idea of epic fails and getting around it because I did put some time into, I couldn't sleep last night. And I, I think over the last three years, we're celebrating our third year together. Over the last three years, I've watched you and your friends, including myself, and I watch patterns that, so Sandy and I launch businesses all the time. Ooh, got to learn something. Like I, I got a brand new erection business. I'm not kidding. I found this really cool yeah. powder, which Eddie, I need your help on. Which I named. Yep. Yeah. It, it basically is a powder that is like He Cialis. said erection, guys, not election. No, it's a powder that gives men an erection like Cialis and um, Viagra. And it also makes women horny too. Without the drugs. It's 100% herbal. Yep, nine ingredients. That's it. We've discovered out about. I'm still waiting for the samples. Uh, we're bringing it, Eddie. We're Got there. Got it in our suitcase. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. So this is my thought. The first time we all fail, which happens every day, right? Mm -hmm. Every day. Mm -hmm. The first thing you should do is what is number one? Stop complaining. It, but we have to complain a little. Like, well, well, damn! You can only stop something if you start. Yeah, but don't, do you complain? Of course I complain. You, you, oh my you, God. You, I didn't complain. I didn't get up to sleep the other day. Yeah, but that's not an epic fail. It like, was epic because I wanted to go to bed and get eight hours of sleep yeah. so I could get work done. And guess what? I didn't get enough sleep, so I didn't get very much work done. I, I, epic fail. I find people that live in the complaining world, like my former ex-mother-in-law, that's all she did. She was literally the gold Olympic champion of complaining. <laughs> she lives in that world and she can't get out of it. No, she's stuck there forever. She, forever, right? It's like, it's like being stuck in asphalt. But you know what I mean? Concrete. People, when they live in the world of complaining, if they allow it to overwhelm them, they will live in it. So here's the first thing. Hey, you get the right for the first 30 seconds to just yell out every expletive, be upset complain but when that 30 second egg timer goes ding you're done time it time it literally go ah. number two is take responsibility how do you do that with your team how do i take responsibility yeah like how do you they do don't do something yeah it's tough isn't Ugh. it you have to acknowledge it and then you have to start asking for something to change do you feel that it's harder to stop complaining or to take responsibility. Take responsibility. Stopping complaining is easy. You just shut your mouth. Taking responsibility, then you're fighting it. Like, but, 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 and then you have to get past the buts. But does the taking responsibility sometimes burn you out? It burns me out a lot. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, am I the one that's always picking the wrong people? I know, I thought that too. Right? <laughs> That's like the, I should be like, we should put that on the wall. We should have an artwork saying, did you pick the right one today? Yeah. So here's a thought. If you get someone to work for you for free, don't expect them to be uh, making you millions because they're free. Okay. You get what you paid for. A professional is expensive and amateur is, oh. it's a fortune. A fortune. Yeah. Just remember you start getting free people they're going to cost you a lot yep, because they're free, right? Same if you get really inexpensive people. Yeah, well, it, 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 but it depends. It depends. Like if we look at Upwork mm -hmm. and you hire somebody that's really, really inexpensive to you, but expensive to where they live, you know? Like, Still, the really, really good ones in Upwork, they look inexpensive in the beginning, but then they tack on everything. So then they become expensive. Those are the really good ones. Go ahead, Jared. Do you want to say something? No, oh, I'm, he's like, no, so, I'm not on up work, but I, I'm I want, on expensive work. <laughs> but I want us to think about this idea that we need to make sure we take responsibility. Okay, here's the next one. And this comes from my uh, going through the, I, I, I started to become a priest, a Jesuit priest when I was young. So I went to the seminary. Mm -hmm. And number three is something we all learn to do. Forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. You know what? I get it. It's your fault. But hey, you live in this world of not forgiving yourself. You got those cement boots on. Yep. You're not able, able to move. You got to forgive yourself. In order to do that, you got to go, all right, I messed up. I take responsibility. I have to move forward. Mm -hmm. 
Now you don't don't forget what happened. Don't don't forget about that guy that bought you one way airline tickets. Always round trip. Hello, <laughs> per diem is good too. What you per diem? You get a per diem in a relationship. You maybe? should. That's what I'm saying. Negotiation, people. Negotiation. You dated a guy that you had a. That's called a hooker, by the way. If I'm you had a kidding, per diem. Ken. I oh, did not have okay. a per diem. I'm okay. saying you should negotiate <laughs> a per diem into the okay. relationship. Okay. How you doing? I am fifteen hundred dollars a day per diem. That <laughs> would be a hooker. Yeah, you just get it in those little credit cards. <laughs> I'm trying to teach people what I did not do that I should have done. Do not do a per diem in your relationship. Okay, don't do that. I don't even know how you came up with that. Okay. Maximizing it. So we first stop complaining. Number two is we take responsibility. Number three is we, of course, forgive ourselves. Number four, I like this one. Number four. Celebrate the failure. Okay. I use that word. I know you probably don't. No, I don't. No, you don't. What would you call it then? What would you call it? I don't know. I don't celebrate my failures. I just learn from them and move on. I am. And you know, sometimes I brag about them. Like, oh, you think you failed? Let me tell you my story. It's so good. Today I'll get a cup of tea. Can I tell you a gross failure? It was two weeks ago. So I have deviated septums. If you know this. <laughs> You're going to really tell this I'm going to tell the story. Um, so we go to the gym and what I do, this is gross, everyone. Redna, I, think of that video I sent you recently. Okay, so what I have to do is I literally have to take a Kleenex and twirl it in my nose to clean my nose out. It's gross. Twirl it. So I'm at the gym and, oh man, I have to, I can't breathe. So I went up there, twirled it, and this giant piece of toilet paper. It wasn't even toilet paper, was it? it was no, like it was paper tissue. towel. Got stuck in my nose, like way up here. So I'm at the gym, head forward, going, Sandy. trying to blow this out of my nose, going, this is so damn painful right now. And people, and I'm in Dubai and they're looking they're going, like this. I'm looking down. <laughs> so they're probably thinking, <laughs> I thought he hurt his neck. I'm like, what? what's wrong with you? So I, I finally find Sandy and her friend, Sarah, and I go, uh, guys, I have a really strange problem right now. I need some tweezers. I need tweezers. Cause I have, and I thought it was like, a little like this big yeah he couldn't get it with the tweezers so i'm like let me just get it he's like i can't lay my head back i, like, I can't lay my head back because if it goes back it's going to fall into just my let me get it so i pull it and i see it and it rips okay so i do it again two times it rips i'm like oh shit he's gonna have to suck it back in okay, so there's like good. just suck it back in no 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 and then finally i get it and i pull it and it keeps coming keeps coming it was like coming. this big it was like this big right and what's the first thing i do I go, yeah, and I celebrate. I got it out, right? It was like, and we were like, oh. but that's what a failure celebration should feel like. Like you literally have unclogged everything that's been obstructing what's going on because you finally got that failure behind you. Yeah, You can breathe, well, I could breathe. See, I think what happens is if we don't acknowledge our failure, if we don't forgive ourselves, and if we don't celebrate it, you haven't made yourself fully aware of it. Yep, and that was a failure you couldn't suck back in. <laughs> Michael, we were just talking about you. Michael Bishop, we were just talking about the best chiropractor in Asia, possibly in the world. Yes, don't be shocked, everyone. He's not Asian. Okay, so <laughs> we have just celebrated our failure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now comes the time that I think many of us neglect. You ready? Yes. Debrief yourself. You do this. I think I do. Now, do you do it? Absolutely. Of course. Debriefing yourself is really going back in the historical side, saying, all right, hey, I, I am not upset with myself anymore. I have taken responsibility. This is mine. How many times have you exercised and you hurt yourself? You're like, I, I, like I've been running lately and I'm hurting myself like crazy running. Like, yeah, all the time. <laughs> How many times do you go, all right, now how did I do it? Oh, I twisted my foot because I hit that hole. And all right, where was that? And you start to remember the process of getting hurt so you don't do it again. That's kind of like what a debrief is. You go through history to analyze what happened so you don't do it again. So what it is, I, I went back and I said first, uh, what did I do that worked? So I want you to go back to fa that failure with that guy that bought you one-way tickets. Yes. Was there anything in that relationship that worked? You listening to him talk, Brad? No, what worked? 
I guess it worked for him. <laughs> you got to travel some cool locations. I guess so. Right? Like to be stranded. No, you pretty didn't. much held at gunpoint. You didn't know that. Felt okay. Like it. What didn't work? What worked is I got to go to more Tony Robbins stuff without paying more money. You there know, you go. I already paid a lot of money. Yeah, like, like a lot of money. Two hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> But what worked was you got to do that. What didn't work, you obviously said earlier. Whole relationship. What should you or could you have done differently? Not said yes to dating him. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I no, think... really, I'm kidding. I felt it in my gut was like, stay away from this guy. He's a psychopath. And somehow I got manipulated into yeah, it. But it sounds like every running relationship is like that. No, some of them, the guy wasn't a psychopath. He was just boring. Maybe you were the psychopath. No, no? not me. Okay. Was baby, am I a psychopath? If you're asking for a per diem in a relationship. I was making a joke. Oh, okay. He can't yeah. get over it. By the way, from now on, give me a per diem. <laughs> I just love that. Hey, I can't wait to date you. I really would like you to talk to me on Instagram. Don't text message me. Don't call me after 11 o'clock or DM me after 11 o'clock. Please pick me up. Open the door, which is always important. I need a per diem of this. Oh, and make sure only take me to vegan restaurants. And, wait, wait, and, wait, wait, wait. Your Lamborghini must have butt warmers. Wait, wait. Did you say per diem in a relationship? Okay. Makes sense. So we're going. Ladies, through... that should be a golden rule. Again, we're going through the debriefing yourself. What worked? What didn't work? What could you have done differently? Mm. I said, said no. Right. And then last one is what did I miss completely? That's a really good question the psychopathic behavior and your red flags your red flags right you wouldn't have actually dated that guy if you listened to what red flags. your red flags and that's where our epic failures are supposed to help us and that is as you debrief yourself you come to that last one what would i've done differently mm -hmm. oh i would have looked for my wallet not in the room where all the light is but where my wallet was lost i would have probably had paid people not gotten them for free to help me out. Oh, how about this one? I would have gotten a better attorney. Yes. Trust me. That is a big one. I would have better contracts, um, better communication. I wouldn't have sent um, a text message. I would have sent an email with all the information. I mean, there's so many things we would have done differently. The problem is we forget about that because we didn't debrief ourselves and we do it over and over again. Yep. It's a recurring circle of us always having epic fails because we don't do the things we said we will do later on. True. Oh, I hate it. I've done this. He's, he's so worked up about it because he's taking his own advice right now. No, but like, for example, how many times do we do something? I'm going to just do it differently. And we forget. Oh. Because we didn't debrief ourselves. I love Dante. He's like, yeah, Why? can you know me? <laughs> <laughs> okay number six recommit yourself meaning you're not going to do the same thing like sandy after that guy she was dating the per dm thing was a joke can get over it the sandy relationship she didn't say i'm going to go back and date him Another i'm gonna psychopath. i'm gonna recommit myself and getting back into the dating race to a different kind of psychopath to a, yeah you did have a string of them mm -hmm. um by the way, it's not just you. I've noticed a lot of women. Oh, yeah. It always boils down to self-worth. It does. That's right. So, guys, if you know you're a psychopath. Oh, oh, anyone here? If anyone? you know you're a psychopath. Eddie, Eddie, are you a psychopath? And if you have someone in your life mm -hmm. that's sticking with you, probably have low self-worth. You, if you want to keep them and continue to be a psychopath, stick with it. Yeah, but guys don't care after you know at a certain point. It's not self-worth, it's all about a vagina. You know, it doesn't yeah, matter. But after a while, not listen, always. I don't want to be a psychopath. Not, okay, excuse me. For the day gay community, Thank you, I don't know what it is. Notice yeah. I didn't go there. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> Sorry to gross you out, Eddie. <laughs> yes. Actually. A mangina, baby. A mangina. So recommit yourself, saying, you know what? You know that the whole idea of falling off the horse, you got to get back on. Mm -hmm which I had a horrible horse situation last week. Ooh, you might not be getting back on a horse. Uh, I'm get, I have to get a horse. I got to get a horse in three what weeks. What happened was nuts. The horse went up on two feet and then came down and I crushed one of my, 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 man, my man things. Yeah. Okay. Cougars. So recommit yourself. 
Here it is now. Number seven is the thing that's going to, remember, we started with stop complaining, take responsibility, forget, forgive yourself, celebrate the failure, debrief yourself, now recommit yourself. Number seven is create a new plan. Like how we did that in sync. Let's talk about this. You've been getting great responses to Confidence Jam when people talk about it. Yes. But that's not a scalable model. No. So you have to market on platforms. Yes. So we've created a new plan. You have multiple times. Yes. Because you've, tri <laughs> you've yes. tried Quora as a platform. Yeah, well, we tinkered with Quora. Right. But you tried. You realized that it's not scalable because it takes so much work. So much time. You've tried Pinterest. Pinterest, we had to build up. So now we're trying Pinterest. Okay. You've tried uh, Facebook ads. Didn't work, right? So every time what you're doing, but you're not giving up. Nope, keep you're trying. You're retweaking. Remember that quarter return that uh, Alexander Graham Bell did? You have to constantly do that quarter return because that's where success is going to pop in is that quarter return. Don't get, if you have a great product, if you go, this is, could you imagine whoever it was, a guy or girl that invented the heated toilet seat? I love them. I want to send them flowers and birthday cards right? every year. But how did he do it? Hey, hey, come over to my house. Sit here. No, I'm not going to go sit on your toilet seat. I confess the first time. Wait, Ralph wants, Ralph wants to say seat, something. Ralph who invented it, but I'm pretty sure it was invented in Japan. Probably a community project. Probably. I told you those Japanese will take the world. I told but, but, you. but I just want you to think about this idea. How would you market this? Because you have to somehow experience it. They probably had to figure out multiple ways of marketing this to get it out. Probably the first one was, hey, come over to my house. Just just lock yourself in my, my bathroom for a moment. No, it's because you know, I was in Japan in the early 80s. And at that time, most of the toilets were essentially outhouses. And the only room that was uh, heated was usually the living room. And when I say heated, I'm talking about a central, central uh, table, actually, with a hot lamp underneath that you had a blanket on top of. So when you had to go to the bathroom, man, it was cold. <laughs> and so uh, that really was a good incentive for Toto, the uh, manufacturer, yeah. to get into heating toilets. And of course, they've excelled at it ever since, from not just heating, but spraying and you name it. So All I know is whoever did that, I'm just, I don't know the history like you do. I'm very impressed, by the way. It sounds like you're one of those guys that I could throw a different business out and you'll give me the history, which I love. <laughs> but the marketing approach for everything we do, if you have a great product like the heated toilet seat, like mm -hmm. Sandy's Confidence Sham, you have to find the right avenue to get the best scalable marketing, to get the engagement you need, to get the people to take the program to have the transformational change. Correct. Right? Correct. First one's not always the best. No, nope. first is your worst. Your first, first is always, generally always your worst. Worst. Yeah. <laughs> I like the way it is. Like my first wife. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. But that's, you know, we all learn. We yeah. all learn. Okay, create a new plan. Reality check on your plan. Is this real? Really? Can I really do this? Huh. You know, it's kind of resembling my last plan. Oh, reality check was my last plan. Failed. We got a tweak. We got a modify. Mm -hmm. And then last, execute the plan. So one of our good friends, a guy named Wayne Boss, uses three words. Love it. Do you know what they are? Yes. The first word is? Knowledge. Knowledge. Gain the knowledge to really understand whatever that is. By the way, Wayne is a multi, multi-billionaire, mm -hmm. billionaire. And these are his three words he uses no matter what he does, what he goes into. The first one is? Knowledge. But the thing with knowledge is you don't even have to have the knowledge. You could also recruit someone with the knowledge. That's it's right. just get the knowledge. It doesn't have to be in you or head, but just have it around And, and it's very interesting because if when you meet Wayne, Wayne is a normal guy in blue jeans and he will, if there's knowledgeable people, wherever they are, he will fly there and hang out with them yep. anywhere in the world. Like I am going to wait. Wayne, Wayne goes, I want to learn about um, uh, a vitamin company. I will fly now to the top vitamin companies in the world and learn about vitamins. He gains the knowledge. Once he gets the knowledge, he gets the courage, the courage now because he knows that industry, that space, that product. He knows it because he's gained all this knowledge. He's got the courage 
And then what happens? He takes action. Action. He makes it happen. He turns it on. Knowledge, courage, action. By those three, th that is his Bible. Because he even says, I don't have the courage yet to take the action, meaning he doesn't have enough knowledge to move forward. Yeah, so it's not backwards. It's not action, knowledge, courage, or action, courage, knowledge, or courage, action, I, I, knowledge. Yeah, I get, I get where you're going with that. It's always knowledge is first. So if you are looking at building a business somewhere and you got, or like, how about this? You have a business and you go, oh, you know what? I'm going to open up a shop here or an office here. Get the knowledge to make sure you're in the right location. Mm -hmm. Make sure you have the right landlord if you're going to be renting or make sure if you're building, it's the right property. Make sure the infrastructure is there to establish proper growth. Make sure you can hire people where you're at. I know a lot of people go, look how beautiful my building is. Yeah, but where's your employees? Oh, we have to bust them in. Oh, you didn't think about that one. So the knowledge, which allows you to take the courage to make it happen, which is the action side, knowledge, courage, action. Epic fails for Wayne have diminished massively. Mm -hmm. That's why he's a billionaire. Because yep. he knowledge, courage, action in a repetitive fashion. So in many cases, once he got the knowledge, he had the courage to walk away and uh, do but, something. But, but, but you're right. <laughs> yes. But you're totally right because he has done that. Yeah. He has walked away because he didn't start it. That's why he doesn't lose money. He only makes money. You know, he is, he's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. You know, I, I, I know I've told many of you the story. He told me, Ken, I need to find a publicly traded company in America. I'll go find one. And I found one. I met the CEO. We all became friends. And it was a vitamin company, actually. And he goes, all right, set me up with the board. Set me up with the board. Okay, so we did this big board meeting. Wayne walks in, never meeting anybody. There's this giant whiteboard on the wall. And Wayne looks at the board because they know why Wayne's there. He's there to actually possibly buy this company. And Wayne goes, hey, let's do this. First, let me, let me see if I understand your business. So on this whiteboard, he drew this schematic down on this whiteboard of the business. It took him about 15 minutes. And he goes, am I right? They go, yep, the entire board. Then he erases the whiteboard. And he goes, let me tell you what's wrong with your business now. And he does the same thing. He draws this, this schematic down to the process and the problems around their business. 15 minutes later, he looks at the entire board. He goes, do, you, do I get it? Am I right? They go, yep. He erases the whiteboard. And he goes, let me show you how I'm going to transform your business. Goes back up to that whiteboard and he spends a half hour drawing a detailed schematic of how he's going to transform this business. And then he looks at everybody and everyone's got what's called a JDM, a jaw dropping moment. They're all, yes, right? And uh, he goes, let's talk tomorrow. Next day, I call the CEO up. I go, what do you think about Wayne? They go, we love Wayne. We want Wayne. I go, do you remember what his plan is to transform the company? They go, how can we forget? He wrote it in permanent marker on our whiteboard. He literally had another marker with him. That is because he had the knowledge he knew exactly what it took. And by the way, he did a 30X on that company. 30X in 18 months. He clearly left his mark. Oh, you and Sandy. So, funny, Ralph, I love it. so Sandy. Yes. Of all those things that I wrote down, let me bring them up again. Stop complaining, take responsibility, forgive yourself, celebrate your failure, debrief yourself recommit yourself, create a new plan, reality check and execute. Which one do you think is the hardest for you? For me? Yeah. Um, hardest one. I would say reality check. <laughs> what? Uh, why? Why is that? I'm like, this is amazing. This is going to work. It's so good. I'm going to put everything into it. And then I'm like, oh, that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> probably should have looked at that a little closer really so how would you then if reality check is the hardest for you yeah. would then you, i have to go back to the beginning <laughs> oh you have to go right you, you can't go midway and say we just got 50 no, no, I'm like, I'm stop complaining for that one let's move on so then if, if it didn't work let's start again so if reality check which is by the way the second to the last thing to do just like, <laughs> i know worry. i know that's what you asked which was the hardest what do you think you need to do 
to make the reality check better with reality? Actually do it. I, I kind of glaze over that part. The Create a new plan. And then I take the knowledge, the courage, the action, I execute, but I never reality checked it. Like, mm. Really? That's so if that's one of those things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but it looks good. And I have an amazing reel. Okay. Uh, <laughs> for me, you ready for this? Yeah. Forgiving yourself. Uh, yeah, because I'm formally Catholic, right? You, you never forgive yourself. You're Catholic. It just always goes with the territory. And I have guilt. All this guilt that weighs on top of me. I actually have to admit, and I hate to say this, I'm going to be very vulnerable, executing. I, I go through it all. I have all these businesses sitting on the shelf of like a million dollar business, a billion dollar business. And my problem is I have all the knowledge, the courage I can't execute on mm -hmm. because you don't have a fire under your ass. No, I can light one. I've, I'm always afraid of failures. You know, that's one of my biggest fears is because I failed miserably. And I have this in my mind and I'm, I'm not justifying it. I'm just explaining where my psychosis is, is I don't want to let others down, not just myself, because I kind of lead them. And if they see their leader fail, I feel like I will disappoint them. Which is a failure. In itself. It is a failure in itself. So execution is my toughest one. Anyone? I oh, I don't want to stick it in my nose. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone on, on your side that want to basically say that there's a certain point to where it's tough for them. Again, I'll go through them. Stop complaining. Are you able to stop complaining? Can you take responsibility? Will you forgive yourself? Do you celebrate your wins? Do you debrief yourself? Do you recommit yourself? Do you create a new plan? Do you do the reality check? And then do you go execute the plan? Which one is difficult for you? Anyone? Well, I'll just Anyone? go first, uh, forgiving myself. So forgiving myself. And then also I noticed by looking back, I surrounded myself with people that were also willing to blame me. So I think part of forgiving yourself also is you got to be careful. You don't want a bunch of yes sayers, but you also don't want everybody agreeing that you were the failure because I allowed that to uh, hold me back after a failure for seven years or six years. So it really crushed me. Yeah. Ooh, that's interesting. Yeah. That's a big deal. I, you know, I have another one that many of us fail at. We fail to get the no up front. You know, I spent, Chris Voss is a really good friend. He never split the difference. He's been with us for the last week, week out here in Dubai. And Chris is out of his negotiation tactics. He always says, get the no fast. Don't wait for it. Yeah. You know, like, oh, I'm going to, I know there's, I'm going to date that girl one day. Yeah, I'm going to, she may never even be interested. She might even be a lesbian. I mean, she's not even interested in the guy. <laughs> Go find out right away, right? Get the no up front so you don't dwell on thinking you're going to get a yes from that. Get the no up front. And I think a but lot for of- for some reason, the guys don't hear the no. Oh, Ladies, yeah. come on, you know, we're like, no. Oh, no, really, you should call me. No, I'll pick you up on Friday. No, what's your number? Just give me your number. Baby. I think what happens no. is if a woman had a no shirt on, no, they would always see on. On, I'm going to get on that one. No, it's no, right? <laughs> yeah, but get the no up front. Anyone else of those components that I mentioned, which one forgiveness uh, or excuse me, responsibility is important one, Dante, anyone else? No one else? Uh, for me, I would have to go. Go ahead, go ahead. Andy. Uh, I would have to go with the reality check. Uh, unless I don't understand what you mean by that. Uh, if I allow the quote unquote reality to dictate what I'm going to do, uh, that limits my options. That limits. Uh, well, no, but the reality I, I want to check, bring something new into, into the reality, right? Understand the reality check is to look back at what has happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're not saying, oh, I, I reality check is moving forward, can I do this? No, of course you can do it. It's the reality of what you've done in the past. Are you almost repeating the same steps of what okay. the last failure was? Okay. That's what the reality is, mm. right? So for, for, for someone like you, you may have worked with the wrong people. Someone may have stolen your ideas. Right. Are you dealing with somebody that is credible, ethical, and reliable? Yeah, right? that's, uh, that, that's the most difficult part, yeah. Yep. Finding the right, right people to work with. 
That's right. So the reality check is, am I dealing with the right people moving forward in my new reassessment when my plan is? Yes. Right. Uh, Jared, you want to say something? Uh, mine is along the same line as yours is uh, not taking action because of confidence in self or not feeling that I was good enough yet or had enough to do X, Y, Z, or I wasn't ready. I didn't, I hadn't accomplished enough, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm sitting next to this person that when she says I'm going to do it, it gets done like that confidence jam. She didn't just write the program she designed the graphics the animation she learned final cut pro she blew my mind away to this day i'm blown i really am i'm blown away so when i look at when you take the action you jump in the deep end of the pool and you even if you can't swim you learn to swim and then you become an olympiad in the process no but you when you commit you look at our relationship our relationship you committed a hundred percent and i don't even get a per diem not per day. I, and I, I it's come to change. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we can rename it a per annum. <laughs> but it's like per year. Let's look at epic failures as an epic opportunity to find the next your opportunity and celebrate that win. So go back and probably look at that entrepreneurial shelf of ideas and, and things and ask yourself the question is, if I would have taken the responsibility for the failure and forgiven myself, could I've actually turned that into something, into something that would really bring me great success? Yes. And there's probably a lot of them. Yep, I would say yes to that. Like my book. <gasps> Ken's gonna finally write his book in 30 years. <laughs> We're so excited. <laughs> yeah. I need to go take a confidence jam program, which by the way is kicking ass. I'm super excited because confidence jam, Sandy's program, which by the way, you only have a month and a half left of it. This season. Oh, you mean this round of this round? Because January is when the new ones start. January and the new ones. It's incredible that people are in your class now. Yes. I know. So Jared, is it awesome? Um, I, I have said many, many times to many people, I think that Sandy undersells it by calling it confidence jam. I think that it's, and I don't say this lightly, but it's, it's a magical program that really gets, it, it sort of surprises you in the effectiveness and how it gets to the root of what's holding you back first. And then from there, it, it builds bricks to build the, the foundation of where you're going to go and then who you become in the process. So you are stronger and more brilliant version of yourself along the way. You become a but everyone, to be fair, he's only in week six. So wait until he gets to week 12 and he'll be like, confidence jams around name. It's literally a Beyonce song. I'm just saying, okay? I, 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 get, where, I get where Jared's coming from. I, I think that's why I'd like to reveal you. And that's it. That's, that's, what we call it. that's the high-end program. So guys, we want to thank you so much for hanging out with us. Uh, just, um, just to tell you, we will be back with you next week. Right? That's our last we week in Dubai. Sleeping. We'll be here. We'll be in Dubai one more week. And we want to thank you all for sharing time with us. Everyone, thank you so much. I love you, honey. Thank you. I love you, honey. I love you guys too. See you guys Bye. all later. Thank you. you guys Bye. are adorable. Thank you guys. Bye.